good to uh, good to be before you this morning and and to share. Let me encourage you to take out your message notes from inside your your bulletin. They look like this. Take those and uh, use those to follow along with us today. Also, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14 this morning. And we are in the fourth week of our stewardship series. We do this every year. Uh, This year, our message uh, series is called Plastic Donuts, right? And if you guys have been here for the last few weeks, you know what that is and what that means. And if you haven't been, then you probably think we're all crazy, which we may well be. Uh, I want to I want to clarify something this morning. I, I think I caused a little bit of confusion last week in uh, in my message, and that is because uh, I talked about the uh, the story from the Gospel of Luke, where the woman comes and anoints Jesus' feet with oil and with her hair. Do you guys remember the story that I told last week? And I had several people ask me about that and said, look, I, I, I thought that I understood that that woman who did that was Mary Magdalene. You guys, you, you've, you've heard this, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you asked me about this. And I taught last week that it was Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus from Bethany. And I just wanted to clarify, because it's a little bit confusing, that's one of the the very few stories like that that is told in each one of the Gospels. Uh, And as is normal, in each one of the Gospels, you get a little bit different perspective on the story, and you get some details in this Gospel that you don't get in this one. And so, as I told you last week, uh, probably the best way to do it is to take all of the four stories and get your whole picture from all four of the different places. Well... In the four Gospels that talk about that story, uh, only one of them mentions the woman who anointed Jesus by name, and that is the one in Luke that refers to her as Mary of Bethany, okay? Uh, Traditionally, Christians have believed that the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with oil is Mary Magdalene, and that's because in a couple of other places, it talks about her being a woman who has sinned greatly or a woman who has committed sexual sin. It doesn't say Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene's talked about in other places in the Bible. But people assumed that that's what that meant, and therefore tradition became that that's who it was. Uh, Two possibilities. Number one is that it really is Mary, the sister of Martha and and Lazarus, and that's just how it is. Uh, Or it's possible that this is actually two different stories, one that happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and one that happened at the end of his ministry, and possibly they're talking about two different women who did something similar at two different times. Uh, But the best that I understand it as I study uh, the whole of the Gospels is that this is a story about Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Everybody clear? Everybody happy? Everybody uh, satisfied for the rest of your life? Don't be, okay? Don't ever, don't ever be satisfied based on what I say. Go and, and you know what? We have the beautiful freedom to open God's Word and study and learn for ourselves. Amen? And so I want you to, to hear me. I want you to follow uh, my le- biblical leadership, but I also want you to understand I am not the authority in your life. God is the authority. The Bible is the authority. So you go and you determine Uh, how to interpret that on your own. Okay, in week one, as we kind of review where we've come from over these past few weeks, we said that while no one really wants to talk about money and church and God, amen, the reality is that our finances are an incredibly important component of our relationship with our Heavenly Father, that we not only have the ability to bring joy to our Heavenly Father when we give Him meaningful gifts, We get to experience joy ourselves when we give with the right attitude and when we give in the right way. In week two, we talked about the kind of offering called first fruits or the tithe. And we said that because everything, do you remember this? Come on, you can kind of do it mentally in your head. Everything belongs to God, good. Everything comes from God and everything is given by God. Uh, We know that we are not owners of anything, but we are only stewards of of everything God has blessed us with, and that is why the Bible tells us to honor Him with the first and the best part of everything 
that we have. In week three, we talked about a second kind of offering called a free will offering, which is an opportunity for us to worship and bring honor to God by giving gifts in a way that we choose. Do you remember this? In an amount that we choose either directly or indirectly to God. And I actually challenged you to go out last week and to find a way to give a free will offering that would glorify God. How many of you chose to do that in this past week? Awesome. All right, I hope you were blessed by that, and more importantly, I hope God was blessed by that. Well, this morning, I want to talk a little more practically about giving and how our feelings about giving are so often connected to our financial circumstances. And what I've discovered over the years is that the reason most people don't give or have such negative feelings associated with giving is that their financial situations make it very scary to consider giving anything away. Most people who struggle with giving, and this is especially true of tithing, most people will say, I can't tithe. I can't afford to give. And what they're really saying is, my financial situation is just too scary. I have so little that I cannot imagine operating with less than what I have. Or, and this is equally true, or I have so much, it's almost too much to risk losing if I start giving some of it away. But the reality is, most of the time, our fears about giving are significantly impacted by the way in which we manage our finances, both good and bad. Now, all of us have our own personal management style when it comes to money, and that's really what we're going to talk about this morning, okay? And if you're thinking to yourself, okay, great, the preacher is going to tell me about managing money. Well, listen, what I'm going to do is, is I, this is way more fun, I'm just going to describe all your terrible habits, okay? I'm not really going to preach to you anything, I'm just going to describe what you do. A- and then I'm going to take God's Word and I'm going to apply them to your terrible habits. Isn't that, doesn't that sound awesome? And then when, when we get done, you can be mad at God and not me, which is always my goal, okay? Okay. So all of us have a sort of a different way that we handle our finances or the way that we deal with things when it comes to money. For instance, we have all kinds of people represented in this room right here. I know this because I see you in these places, okay? We have Walmart shoppers who value a bargain, amen, Walmart shoppers, yes. I saw Marty McBee yesterday at Walmart. And then, of course, then, then, then we have the high class you know, quality people who shop at Sam's Club, okay? So, so we've got a lot of different people here. Uh, we've got cash people. We have credit card people. There are people who very carefully balance their checkbook every month right down to the last penny. And then there are those of you who just kind of close their checkbook every two years and start all over again, right? And just like grace and mercy, you know? It's all going to be okay. We've got all kinds of of different people in this room when it comes to money. And, And look, no matter what your personal financial management style is, I'll be honest with you. I think that we're all going to find the teachings of Jesus from Luke 14 that we're going to read today to be very challenging. Maybe for some people, it's going to be a little bit even painful today. In fact, this morning, I feel a little bit like a doctor with a hypodermic needle in his hand. You know what I'm talking about? Who says bend over? This is going to hurt a little bit, but trust me, it's it's going to make you feel better when, when everything... It'll be worth it. It really will when it's all done. Now, often during our stewardship series each year, I teach on a parable that Jesus told from Luke chapter 12 about a guy who was enormously successful in the financial arena of his life. He put on a clinic in terms of work ethics. He put on a clinic in terms of wealth management. And that was all good. But in the parable, Jesus criticizes this man for his attitude and his approach. And I always try to point out that though Jesus criticized this wealthy man, he didn't criticize him for his affluence. He criticized him for his arrogance. Because the wealthy man tried to find life 
and meaning in his stuff, and he never thought about anything beyond his money. And if you know the story, you may remember that he then died suddenly without having ever considered the role of God in his life or the role that God might have wanted him to play in this world. Well, today it's more of a mini parable that Jesus tells us in Luke 14. And Jesus kind of raises the opposite concern of that first guy. Here, he's going to talk about those who don't give enough attention to the management side of their finances, to those who don't give enough planning to the management side of their wealth. Okay, this is Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30. Here's what he says. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Now, just I want to ask you a question. Are you... Are you ever like me? Do you ever read a passage of Scripture and you read it and you kind of, you know, you nod your head and you're like, yep, that's Scripture right there. And you're like, I really, I'm sure there's significance to that. I know that means something, but honestly, I have no idea what. Please don't call on me. Do you ever think that? Like in in a community group or a Bible study, please don't call on me. Because yes, I heard it, but I have no idea what that means. Sometimes the Bible can be a little bit difficult for us. To understand, and most of the time when that happens, it's because of sort of a cultural roadblock, a cultural separation for us. Makes it tough sometimes. Well, here's what's interesting to me in this. As you read that passage from Luke 14, 28 through 30, believe it or not, Jesus is actually using a little bit of humor in this parable. Jesus is trying to be funny. And I feel confident in telling you that when he told this story, the people in the crowd looked at one another and giggled to themselves. (laughs) Jesus, he's funny. I'm just telling you that's probably what happened because in the first century A.D., the thought of someone starting a construction project without first estimating what the full and final cost would be was absolutely ridiculous. Because things were a little different in the first century A.D. In the first century A.D., you see, there was no bankruptcy. There was slavery. Okay? And at the very best, there was prison. And we're not talking about the most, you know, the the cushy, you know, America 2015 kind of... We're talking about the most squalid conditions that you could possibly imagine if you ended up in a situation where you owed someone a debt and could not pay it. So in this culture, it was positively unthinkable that somebody would be so irresponsible as to do this. So Jesus asks almost rhetorically, if you wanted, let's say, to build a tower, wouldn't you first sit down before you build the foundation and wouldn't you estimate what the cost of the tower is going to be before you spent a penny? And here's the interesting thing. Today, in our culture, the answer to that question is very often no. I see some of you shaking your heads. No, we would not do that. Many times in our lives, we build a foundation without estimating the costs that are out ahead of us. I was channel surfing uh, one night a few weeks ago, or as I like to call it, sermon preparation, okay? And and I came across a, a news channel talk show And the theme of the show was the debt diet. Now, you ever heard of this, the debt diet? And and on this show, they had this financial expert working with a a good-looking, highly educated, church-going, upper-middle-class couple who had an income in their household of $200,000 a year. And they were showing pictures of their life, and they lived in a beautiful home, and they drove three really nice cars. And on the outside, this couple looked like the picture of American success. But their debt, their consumer debt, were over $300,000. So they had more, and that's not counting their home. They had more debt than they made in a year. And I'm telling you, as, as you got deeper and deeper into this couple's story, you realize there, was, there were some stress fractures 
going on in the financial foundation of that home. And as you can imagine, it was creating all kinds of anxiety and tension in their lives. And the thought hit me. I can almost guarantee you, you know, I'm thinking about you here, and I'm thinking about this series, and the thought occurs to me, I I can almost guarantee you that this family who identified themselves as Christians is not practicing stewardship. And if somehow they are, I can guarantee you that they're not enjoying it. Because you, you know there is a difference, right? The, either they're not doing it at all, or they are doing it and they hate it. Because when the financial fo- foundation of your home is fractured, it is almost impossible to enjoy giving. Now this couple on TV, they're not alone. A recent Gallup poll found that 64% of all couples list finances as the number one source of conflict in their marriage. Another study reported that 46% of married people keep financial secrets from their spouse. ABC News reported in January that the average college student today ends up with three credit cards carrying a balance of somewhere around $8,000 by the time they finish college. And administrators are saying that kids are leaving college due to financial problems and bankruptcy in their family more often than they're leaving college because of bad grades. Now, where do these stress fractures, and when I say stress fractures, does that make sense to you in their foundation? Where do those things come from? Well, one thing that that has to be mentioned, and let's just talk about three things, okay? One that has to be mentioned is laziness. Now, I, when I first wrote this out, I don't think I put laziness as the fill in the blank because that's not as sensitive as I normally am because you guys know I'm a very sensitive person, right? Amen. You're right, and, and, and I had a really sensitive way to say that, and then apparently I ignored my notes and I ended up with laziness. So I don't know, I don't know what happened there. I apologize to, to anybody that's offended by that. Here's what the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 19. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty. I love the way the message translation puts it. Listen to this. Work your garden, you'll end up with plenty of food. Play and party, you'll end up with an empty plate. That sounds like something I would say to my son, right? Yeah, go ahead, play and party, son, and you'll have an empty plate when the day is done. Now, you probably know people, because there's no one here like this, But you probably know people who can never seem to keep a job, people who seem to depend on family members to support them while they're always looking for just the right job. They've got an excuse for not taking certain jobs. You know, it doesn't pay enough. It's beneath them. It's just not right for them. And everybody can see what's really going on in that person. It's really a character problem. It's a work ethic problem. Reminds me of a a wife who complained to her husband. She said, Honey, I'm ashamed of the way that we live. My mother pays our rent. My aunt buys our groceries. My sister pays for our utilities. I'm ashamed that we can't do better than this. And her husband said, well, you know what? You ought to be ashamed. You've got two uncles that don't send us a dime. (laughs) Right? So look, in some cases... Laziness certainly can be a factor for creating stress in our financial foundations. But, hear me, my experience tells me that laziness is not the problem for most people today. There's another cause of stress in our financial foundation that takes the joy out of our giving, and that is a consumptive lifestyle. You write that word in. I'm, actually, I was very proud of that word this week. A consumptive lifestyle. Now, consumptive, that's not a word I probably use very often. Yes, Mark, would you like to? It says compulsive. I'm confused. Okay. All right. Ignore what it says and write this word, consumptive. All right? Consumptive. And in fact, let me tell you, let me tell you what that means. Consumptive. Thank you, Mark, for pointing that out. That's very good. Consumptive means... To consume in a destructive way. Now think about that for just one second. To consume in a, in a destructive way. And I think you'd agree with me, that's pretty descriptive of the way we all can handle our finances from time to time. 
and probably have handled our finances at different times throughout our life. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Sometimes on impulse, we make some very unwise purchases because we just feel and think that we have to have that thing. Somewhere in your house, how many of you have or have had at some point until you sold it in a garage sale, a Bowflex, a Thighmaster, uh-huh, or a good old-fashioned treadmill? How many of you have had or have one of those? Oh, you're lying through your teeth. Because other, where would you put your dirty clothes if you didn't have one of those things, right? Here's, a, here's another one. Here's another fun one. Go down, to, go down to Stuff Mart or to Best Buy about two hours before the Super Bowl next February, and you will not believe the number of men who will be lined up buying big screen TVs, trying to get them home in time for the big game. Okay, because they're just convinced I've got to have this new and better one so I can enjoy this. And there's no doubt impulse buying typically results in us making purchases without us really con- counting the, the cost, considering the cost ahead of time. The Bible puts it this way in Proverbs 21.20. 20. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. And again, I love the way the Good News translation puts this. Wise people live in wealth and luxury, but stupid people spend their money as fast as they get it. Right? That could be like our life verse or something. Now, interestingly, spending money as fast as you can get it often leads to another issue that contributes to a consumptive, not compulsive, but consumptive lifestyle, and that is consumer debt. Did you know that Americans hold about $3.4 trillion in debt right now? That's trillion with a T. The average American household has an average credit card debt of about $7,700. In 2014, the average number of credit cards owned by a family was 3.7. That's nearly four credit cards per family. And the average family has nearly $1,000 in car payments per month today. 70% of families admit to having made late payments to creditors at some point in their adult life. And 32%, this is maybe the worst... 32% have overdrawn overdrawn their checking account in the previous 90 days. And get this, according to the same report, on average, it would take each of these families 11 years to pay off the consumer debt that they've accumulated if they stopped going further into debt right now. Think about it, 11 years. If you've got kids, your kids will be grown by the time it would take you to pay that off. I guess it's true what they say. Debt keeps you stuck in your future paying for your past. So when it comes to stress fractures in our financial foundations that take the joy out of giving, you know what? Laziness, that's an issue for some people. Many more of us struggle with a consumptive lifestyle. But in my experience, by far the biggest issue most people have that contributes to financial stress and strain is lack of a financial plan. According to the Wall Street Journal, 76% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. I mean, if you think about it, it is amazing that tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars come through our hands every year, but so many put so little thought into a financial plan or into financial goals or in, even into a budget. One poll revealed that 25% of all Americans, that's one in four, believe their best chance to build wealth for retirement, listen, is not patiently saving and investing with a financial plan, but through the lottery, right? The lottery. And yet, the Bible makes a promise in Proverbs 21.5. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. In other words, when you put a simple financial plan together, when you build your foundation right, you will be able to build financial peace into your life. And that allows you to experience giving to your Heavenly Father like you've never experienced before. But that doesn't happen by accident. It takes a plan. Now, 
For years I've been teaching on the different ways that we can use money and, and how reprioritizing can help take a lot of the stress out of the stewardship component of our relationship with God. Today I want to show you an approach to managing your finances that is a little more simplified than what I normally teach to you. And I'm going to teach it to you this way so that hopefully it'll be a little easier to understand, remember, and hopefully implement. It's called the 10 10 80 plan. And, and you may have heard this. You've probably heard of this. The 10 10 80 financial plan. And it, here's what it says. It says that you begin by taking the first 10% of any income that you get, any windfall that you get, any inheritance that you get, yes, any lottery winnings that you get, okay? And you honor God by giving the first 10% of it to Him. So the first part of the 10 10 80 plan is 10%. Go to first fruits. That's your tithe. Honoring God by bringing the first 10% back to Him. Now, did you notice I said bringing, not giving? Remember that? Bringing, not giving. Did you know that the number 10, when you study its meaning, is actually very interesting uh, as a number biblically? Do you know what the number 10 tends to mean in the Bible? The number 10 often means a test. For instance... How many plagues were there in Egypt? Ten. Pharaoh was tested ten times. How many commandments are there? Ten. So how many ways is our obedience tested by the law? Ten. How many times did God test Israel while they were wandering through the wilderness? How many times did God test Jacob's heart by allowing his wages to be changed when he was working for his uncle Laban? How many times was Daniel tested in Daniel chapter 1? In every case, the answer is 10. Jesus told a parable in Matthew 25, 1 through 13, about 10 virgins that had a preparedness test. They were like bridesmaids, it says, waiting for the bridegroom to come. Revelation 2, 10 mentions 10 days of testing in the end times. So throughout the Bible, the number 10 is associated with testing. If you think about it, honoring God first with 10% represents a test for the Christ follower. Now, this principle is is taught in many places in the Bible, but maybe the most famous passage is the one from Malachi 3.10, which we took a look at a couple of weeks ago, where God himself says this. I'm just going to read this back to you. God says, "...bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house." Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there won't be room enough to store it. Now, every person I've ever known that I consider to be a fully surrendered follower of Christ takes this very, very seriously. They give their tithe to the local church that they're a part of, acknowledging God as the leader of their life, acknowledging that they are forever grateful for the provision God has given to them, and believing that God will keep His promise to be supernaturally involved in their finances if they do that. They believe God will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings on their lives that they otherwise wouldn't experience if they didn't honor Him with the first part of their income. Now, I say all that. Does that mean that tithing is some kind of get-rich-quick scheme? No. No. Absolutely not. I would never make that kind of claim. I would never make that kind of promise. But what I would do is tell you that, you know what, while Christine and I may not be rich financially, our family has been blessed again and again and again in ways that we could have never imagined, both financially and otherwise. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've experienced it in your lives as well. I just wish that every one of you could experience God's supernatural touch and involvement in your financial life because you're honoring Him with the first 10% of your income. All right, in this 10, 10, 80 plan, you take the first 10%, that goes to God. The second 10% you use to pay yourself. So 10%, you're going to pay yourself. That's savings and retirement and investments. In other words, before you head to the mall... Before you book the trip to Mickey Mouse World, 
Before you buy whatever it is, you set 10% of your income aside for the future. And I feel like most financial counselors would agree that the order of priority should be savings, retirement, then investments. Proverbs 13, 11 says, Whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Isn't that a great verse? That's often referred to as the miracle of compound interest. All right, little by little it grows. And, and the beauty of God's plan is you don't have to make a lot of money in order to accumulate a lot of savings. Because when you save it little by little, little eventually it grows into a lot. Even if you just make a little and save 10% every time you get some income, it will grow and grow and grow. Now, some of you aren't sure if you believe that. Because you say, well, I don't have a lot. But think of it this way. If you were to save just $4 a day, and that's like Starbucks money, or considerably less than Starbucks money for some of you, right? If you say $4 a day, but you know, if you're, if you're 25 years old right now, think about this, and you invested $4 a day into a typical mutual fund, just given historic performance of mutual funds over the years, do you know what you'd have by the time you were 65 years old? You'd have a million dollars. A million dollars. Now, that's, that's not talking about a matching 401k or some big-time stock portfolio that you add to exponentially year after year after year. I'm just talking about $4 per day at average rates. You know why? Because little by little, savings grows. And each one of us can do that. Now, to be honest with you, I'm always amazed at how many people, especially people that that make what I consider to be good money, whatever that is, right? I can't believe how many people don't have savings. A report in April of this year said that 18% of Americans literally save nothing in a year, and 30% have less than $1,000 in their savings account. I mean, we're just one car wreck or breakdown away from nothing, right, at that point. But again, it does not have to be that way. And think about this. Let's say that for the next year, you save 10% of your income. Can, can you just kind of figure that out in your mind right now, what 10% of your family income would be in your head? If you took that amount and you put it in savings, after a year, how do you think that would impact how you felt about giving to God? Come on, with 10% already set aside for your tithe and 10% sitting in the bank, don't you see how much more enjoyable it would be when it came time to write that check? Or when you were presented with an opportunity for a free will offering like we talked about last week? And in large part, all it takes is a plan because it's not going to happen by accident. So the 10-10-80 plan says if you want to enjoy giving gifts that bring a smile to the face of your Heavenly Father, you honor God with the first 10%. That's a test to see if you're putting him first. You pay yourself with the second 10%, and then with the last 80%, you're going to live joyfully on the rest. That's expenses, that's debts, that's taxes, and things like that. Now, if you think it strange that I would include the word joyfully in that statement, did I just hear him right? Did he just tell me that I'm now going to only live on 80%? And I'm supposed to do that joyfully? Well, consider what 1 Timothy 6, 17 says. God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. See, contrary to what you may think or how you were raised or how much fear may be associated with the thought of money and church and stewardship, when you've honored God with the first 10% of your income, and you've invited his supernatural involvement into your finances, and you've paid yourself 10% in, in some kind of long-range investment plan, listen to me, there is a joyful freedom that comes in learning to live on the remaining 80%. And if you can experience joy in living on 80% of your income, believe me, you will enjoy giving part of that away. Now, I know, I know right away what some of you are thinking. I could never do that. Never. That's totally unrealistic. I have a house payment. I have car payments. I have utility bills that are looking more and more like house payments these days, right? 
I cannot afford to do that. Or it's too late for me to do something like that. Or well, I've gotten myself into such a mess, I could never get out. Well, there's two things I want to say to you. Number one, with God's help, you can do it. Because God has made certain promises to you in the arena of your finances. And remember what I said a couple of weeks ago. What so many of us have never experienced is asking God to put his super on our what? On our natural. Because we just try to do it with our natural all the time. And we forget that he's sitting there waiting to apply what he has to what we have. So number one, you need to understand you can do it. Number two, I want you to come back next week. And we're going to talk about, we're going to look at some very simple and very practical steps you can take to get started down the path to financial peace in your life. Now, let's finish up with, with this. I want you to consider two questions. Here's the first one. If God is who He says He is and will do what He promises to do, what's the worst that can happen? Will you just think about that for a second? If God is who He says He is, and He will do what He promises to do, what is the worst thing that could happen in your life if you surrender to Him in this arena? Now, I want you to think about the second part. What's the best that could happen? Do you agree with me? The best could be pretty good. And if you think about it, the worst is probably not as bad as you think. And then here's the second question. If I decide to leave God completely out of my finances, what's the worst that can happen? And what's the best? And let me ask you this. If you leave God completely out of your finances, how good is the best and how bad is the worst? Does that make sense? You got your natural... You got his super, you put them together, and you trust him to provide. Let me ask you to bow your heads. Heavenly Father, sometimes when it comes to areas of our life that we need to surrender to you, we push back so hard. We are so good at convincing ourselves of things that aren't necessarily true or things that aren't necessarily healthy. God, we look around us in our culture and we see other people in the way that they do it and we either just assume we've got to do it that way or we feel pressured to do it that way. But God, your word gives us a different way in almost every aspect of our life. Your word says, let me show you how to do it this way. Father, I just pray this morning that as we think about our commitment to you in this component of our relationship with you, that we would understand that the worst thing that could possibly happen to us if we surrender everything to you, oh God, you've already taken care of it, haven't you? You've already proven how much you love us and how far you're willing to go to provide for us. God, the best that could ever happen to us apart from you, not only is it not that great, it's not going to last. And so I just pray that we might have a light bulb come on in this arena of our life that we might be willing to surrender to you, to test you, as Malachi says. Let you prove to us what it looks like when you supernaturally become involved in our finances. And God, here's the real point, that you would take this one component and that it would impact and change and affect all of the other areas of our relationship with you. You said where a person's treasures are, That's where his heart is going to be. So God, there's a lot we can learn from this. I pray that we'll be open to you and allow you to speak to us and be willing to respond. I love you, God. I completely trust you to be at work in the hearts of every person in this place today. It's in Jesus' name I pray.